So what do you know about this new guy? What do you think of him? What do you, what do you know about him? Where did he come from? What has he done in the past? What has he accomplished? What are your expectations of him for the future? Will he be a good fit here, this new guy? No, not Pastor Kester, although he is in town now. But Mike Ryder, the new head football coach at the University of Nebraska. Was he a good hire? Will he be a good fit? He certainly brings with him some experience. He's 61 years old. He has at least 10 years under his bad belt at Oregon State. A three-year stint in the NFL with the San Diego Chargers. He brings with him a likable personality and an image that the University of Nebraska would love to pro portray and, and project. He's won some big games, some signature wins in his coaching career, something maybe his predecessor wasn't able to accomplish. He's got a decent record in his bowl game appearances. He's six and two overall. He's known for being able to develop young quarterback talent. At various times in his coaching career, big name schools like Alabama and USC wanted to hire him as their head coach. There's a lot to be excited about with Mike Riley. Some people are very excited, very happy with the hire. Think of a great fit. Mike Riley is exactly what the Huskers need. And those same people probably have some pretty high expectations for their new coach. But not everyone is excited. Not everyone is happy. Some people are a little disappointed, a little frustrated with the hire. Maybe a little underwhelmed with the hire. Maybe he's not the name that they had in mind. Maybe they wanted a bigger name. Maybe they had a specific name in mind. Maybe they wanted someone with some Nebraska ties. Maybe they're quick to criticize and say, 61 years old, he's, he's kind of old. How much life does he have left in him? Does he have the drive? Does he have the fire in the belly? Does he have that determination that we've come to know and expect from a Custer football coach? While he may have a decent record in some smaller bowl games, we, we may have some signature wins. You know, his overall record at Oregon State in 10 years was just over 590. And 80, is that what the Huskers want to be? Just a bit over 500? And his stint with the Chargers was even worse. 14 and 34. Is this the man we really wanted to hire? To compare that with Bo Pelini, his streak of nine win seasons, his overall record of 67 and 28. You know, even with his recorded comments and his tirades and his his rants and his parting shots at the university. There are some out there who still wish Bo Pelini was the head football coach at Nebraska. Just watched the bowl game a week or two ago, right? Players had his name on their arms and on their shoes, and maybe even hidden on the back of their helmets. It's Husker Nation divided. Well, the Apostle John said this about Jesus. He said the crowds were divided because of him. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Yes, why? Why were the crowds, why were the people in Jesus' day divided over Jesus? Well, they were divided because they didn't know where he had come from. They didn't know just who he was. And they didn't know what he had really come to do. Their expectations of him were all over the board. What we have here in John 7 is exactly what we talked about outside, if you remember that, at our outdoor service for pig roast. Remember that Jesus had gathered all of his disciples together, and he looked them square in the eye and he said, who do people say the Son of Man is? Remember what they said? They said the same thing that John says here. Basically, they said, Jesus, the people are divided over you. Some are saying John the Baptist brought back to life, and others are saying Moses or Elijah or one of the other prophets. Divided. On the outside, looking in, we, we, we look at this and we say, are you serious? How? How could the people be divided? How could the people not get it? How could the people not see who Jesus was, where he had come from, what he had come to do, and his plan, his game plan for the future? Because they had ample evidence. John the Baptist on the shore of the Jordan River pointed, literally pointed at Jesus and said, Look, look, the Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And standing in that same river, 
after his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove, and the voice of the Father from heaven said, This one is my Son, whom I love. And yet they're divided, they don't get it, they don't understand. One evening, Nicodemus, with others, heard Jesus say that the Son of Man, that he must be lifted up. Why? Why would Jesus, why would he, why would the Son of Man need to be lifted up? Because God so loved the world. Because God sent his Son, Jesus, the Son of Man. Because God didn't want anyone to perish. Because God wanted everyone to, to have eternal life. But they didn't get it. They were divided. Even after his ministry began, he's up in Canaan, he's at a wedding. What did he do? He turned water into wine. The disciples got it. They put their faith in him. And from that time, what did Jesus do? He, he healed the sick, made the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. Just as Isaiah said he would do. And yet they were divided. They were confused. They didn't get it. John chapter 7, do you know what happened in John chapter 6? Jesus fed the 5,000. He walked on water. Even the winds and the waves obeyed him as he calmed the storm. And the people were divided. They're all over the board. Really? How did they not see it? How, how did they not get it? It's just like today, right? The agnostics, the skeptics, they question Jesus. They try to discredit Jesus. They try to disprove God's word. The atheists, the, the unbelievers deny Christ. They try to silence the word of God. They try to silence Christ. They try to silence Christians. And they too, along with the Pharisees, if they were given the chance, would say, seize him. Way with him. How many people today just look at Jesus and say, not for me. You know what? A little underwhelmed here on what this guy is and what he came to do. Not what I was hoping for. Not what I thought I needed. They want a little more. The atheists, the unbelievers, the skeptics, the agnostic, those who are disappointed, those with their doubts. We never take our faith Jesus for granted. We never take our knowledge of God and His Word and His Son for granted. It's easy on the outside looking in. It's, it's easy to look back at the past. It's easy to look at the world out there today and to listen to them debate and talk and, and, and sound so ignorant and sound so foolish and sound so naive and forget just where we have come from because we could easily say there but for the grace of God go we. And may we never forget our own inborn ignorance and our own stubborn foolishness and our own self-reliant naivete. There but for the grace of God go we. Our faith our knowledge of Jesus and, and, and his word had nothing to do with us. The Holy Spirit brought us to faith in Jesus. Faith is his gift, his gift to us, free of charge. And yet even then, even with our faith, how many times do we, do we ask of Jesus? How many times are we the ones saying of Jesus, who, who is this guy? How many times are we the ones who are left a bit underwhelmed, a bit dissatisfied, a bit frustrated, a bit, a bit disappointed with this hire, this, this Savior, this one sent to save us from sin. How many times do we question, we think, Jesus made the lame walk to death here. Why do I still have this nagging cough or cold or sinus infection or something for this? Why don't you use your power like you once did? You fed the 5,000 and yet you leave me struggling week to week, paycheck to paycheck, trying to make ends meet, trying to keep my head above water. You really have things, everything under control? If God really placed all things under your feet, then why is my life still full of hurt and sorrow and sadness and pain and trouble? Answer this prayer, Jesus. Answer that prayer, Jesus. And, and he doesn't. At least as our eyes see, he doesn't. Bad things continue to happen, and we doubt, and, and we question, and we wonder, is that really the call? Is that really the play you want to send in? Maybe we want to call an audible at the line of scrimmage. Maybe we want to become the offensive coordinator. Maybe we want to take that playbook out of God's hand. Maybe we'd make a better coach. 
Maybe we don't want him to be the one in charge. Maybe, maybe we just like to complain about whoever seems to be in charge of our life. Can we stop? Can we stop for just a minute? Can we take a look at Jesus' resume? Where did he come from? Nazareth, sort of. Bethlehem definitely was the decree of Caesar Augustus that took Joseph and Mary from Nazareth down to Bethlehem so he could be born there, just as Micah had prophesied. But the real answer, the real answer to where Jesus came from is heaven. Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. So the word became flesh. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, made himself nothing. He took on the very nature of a, a servant. He was born of a woman. He was born under law. His resume? Obedience. His resume can be summed up in one word. Love. Jesus loved God. He loved his neighbor. He was patient. He was kind. He was helpful. He was encouraging. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Do we see what's happening here? The coach, the AD, the athletic director, the GM, the general manager, the owner of the team donned the jersey and he got in the game. He played for us. He obeyed for us. He loved for us. We couldn't follow the game plan. We couldn't execute the play as designed. We couldn't fulfill our roles in this, in this team. So he fulfilled them for us. He played for us. He loved for us. And his record? His record against Satan, his record against sin, his record against temptation? Perfect. Undefeated. More than that, it's Ours. See, rather than taking that obedient jersey of his and putting it in a frame and hanging it on a wall in some Hall of Fame brothers to look at and admire, he took off that obedient jersey and he placed it on each one of us so that we could stand holy and blameless before our Heavenly Father. But that victory <laughs> wasn't easy and that game wasn't pretty. It got ugly. It got ugly in a hurry. His resume shows us that there was a, a dedication, a determination, a, a drive, a tolerance for pain here that the world has never seen. His resume reveals that he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. His resume, his resume reveals that just as Moses lifted up that snake in the desert to save those who had been bitten by those venomous snakes, so the Son of Man was lifted up to save those who had been Rejected by sin's deadly poison. He was nailed in place on that cross to set us free. And blood flowed from his body to purify us from all unrighteousness. And God forsook him so he can forgive us and he died to give us life. But his resume doesn't end there. It doesn't end on the cross. It doesn't end in the tomb. This was a destination job for Jesus. Badger fans hope that that Wisconsin is a destination job for the new coach that they just hired, that he'll stay there a very long time, that he'll finish his career there. Our, our work, our, our role for Jesus as our substitute and Savior was a destination job for him. But, but it, the destination was one that he earned for us. As, we pick up his resume just three days later in the empty tomb where he defeated the last and final opponent. Death itself. He swallowed death up in victory, and he gives us that victory free of charge through faith in him. He's the resurrection of the life. <clears throat> Whoever believes in him will live, even though he dies. Who, who, who is this guy? Where did he come from? What's his past? What's his history? What did he do? What, what are his plans for the future? He's in heaven right now. He's preparing a place for us. He's going to come back and Take us to be with him. And in the meantime, of course he's going to take care of us. Of course he's going to keep his promise to work all things, the good and the bad, the happy and the sad, the successes and the failures. He's going to work all that for our good, for our spiritual and our eternal good. 
There's no doubt about that. There's no question about that. There's no, no division about that. So hold a press conference if you want, but tell someone. Tell someone who Jesus is and what he's done for them. Amen. Please stand.